I'd like to talk about HTML5 a little bit. Um, what we're going to do is talk about what's in it a little bit. Um, but we're focused here in this discussion around what is actually, uh, what, things that we can put to use right now. Um, things that uh, are not really ready for cross uh, browser use and kind of the techniques that we can employ to make this stuff happen for real. Um, so what is the stuff in HTML5? There is a lot of things that people say are in HTML5. My definition is a little flexible. You know, geolocation, sure, let's call that HTML5. CSS3, probably not. But, you know, there's a lot of things that are on the edge. Um, the orientation events, probably not in HTML5, but probably pretty cool anyways. So I'm fine with that. It's kind of falling into the cool, shiny stuff bucket. <sighs> um, at the last uh, JS Conf, um, I put out uh, this site, um, HTML5 Readiness, and the main idea here is that we're not dealing with waiting for HTML5 to be ready. We're waiting for features with inside HTML5 to be ready. All these features are implemented incrementally across browsers, so think of it that way instead of, you know, what are the big things? So, uh, for instance, like, at font face and CSS3 has had support in IE6, Five, seven, eight, everything. Um, something like drag and drop has support in IE because that's where the spec came from. Same thing with content editable. But then you look at something like the indexed uh, index DB, and that doesn't really have great support yet. So, uh, yeah. But if we take a look at all of uh, all of the HTML5 features, kind of what, how can we break these up? So, I think we can break them up like this. So here we have uh, dependable features, and these are things that we can use across all the IEs um, pretty comfortably. Roughly usable might take a little bit more work, but we can do it for real. Experimental um, are cool things to play with and enhance the experience with, but might not be ready for, for prime time for everyone. Um, and edge features, and these are the things that, um, you know, people are experimenting with, and there's a lot of cool stuff happening there. but. Um, certainly not going to fly too well in a production environment where you have a wide swath of browsers in, at play. So I've kind of broken up a lot of these things. Um, so inside dependable features, uh, I think these things, these things you can feel extremely confident using. So the doc type, uh, that's about it. No big hairy thing. It's case insensitive. It can be all in caps. It can be lowercase. Um, it could be mixed case if you like to go like the MySpace style of capitalizing. That's cool too. Uh, it'll still keep it in standards mode everywhere. Car set, we used to have this HTTP equiv content type blah 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 sucky thing. Now we got meta car set. It's beautiful. Um, you, uh, just like in HTML4, um, you can self close your tags uh, or not. You can throw qu quotes around things or not. I, I kind of like not throwing quotes around things all the time. It makes me feel alive. It's good, but that's fine if you don't. Um, quotes make you feel safe. Makes you feel good, too. I understand that. That's fine. HTML5 is extremely flexible, you know. You can kind of do whatever style you want. Validator's not going to complain too much. Type attributes are gone. IS6 never needed them. We don't need them. We can just get rid of all of them. New semantic tags, article, nav, and section. Um, we've solved the problems with them. Uh, I didn't style them. It couldn't print them. The HTML5 shim um, has uh, fixes for both those things. The entire HTML5 shim is in modernizer, so you can kind of like pick which one you want to use. It does the same thing. Um, so those are a go. <coughs> uh, the data attributes are rad. Um, they're, yeah, you know, in HTML4, the spec says if, you, as a browser, you encounter an attribute that you're unfamiliar with, just ignore it. Um, you're not going to have to worry about anything breaking here. Of course, in HTML5, we also get a data set um, property on DOM elements. Uh, and 
Uh, that, of course, is something that we have to wait for support for. But using like get attribute, for instance, is not too heavy of a cost. So we can kind of go ahead with this one. And content editable, oh, I love this guy. Um, oh, yeah, then I made it content editable because I was like, oh, it'll be such a good demo if I can just type in here. But then when I have a link, I can't actually click it. That's genius. Huh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to correct the spelling on Mindfuck. Oh, 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 all right, we'll see that maybe later. <coughs> yeah, okay, I just got to show this because it's like the baddest ass thing in the world. Um, yeah, okay, here's the source. Um, the body is totally empty um, in the head. Uh, we just have mostly a style tag that has content editable on it. Um, but then the really crazy shit is that head, title, and style are all display block. Body is display none. So when we're actually looking at this, this is the style tag that we're actually editing. So then, you know, I can change the color of the text to white. And I like fuchsia because it's a challenge to spell. It's like fuchsia. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Fuchsia. Uh, yeah. Anyways, that's a good one. <clears throat> All right. So that, those are the things you can feel really comfortable using um, from i6 and up. You're good. These ones, audio and video was designed for the fallback case. We want to know if there's not going to be support. Um, so uh, it's pretty pretty damn beautiful how this works, right? So video for everyone by Croc came and kind of popularized this technique. We have the video tag, the source attributes calling out our three different codecs that we need to support. Um, MP4 needs to be first because of a bug in the iPad that is now fixed, but keep it first for now. Um, and then anyways, we, we throw a flash object in there. Uh, any non-supporting browser kind of ignores the video tags, the source tags, and then just dives right for that. Um, I will point out, of course, though, if let's say that you like you only want to serve MP4s, um, if you do this technique and you only include the MP4, Firefox, for instance, which doesn't support that codec, will try and use the video tag. It won't be like, oh, I'll use the video tag, but then I can't use that codec, so then I'll fall back to the flash. It doesn't do that. So you actually have to use JavaScript and use the can play type method to see can I use this codec in this browser? If not, then I'll just switch everything in for the flash object. But in general, in this sort of technique, you get a, get a good amount of coverage. <clears throat> yeah, OK. Um, Canvas, we've had X Canvas uh, from uh, Eric Ardvinson and Google for a long time, bringing support through VML uh, to the other browsers. Um, I love this demo by uh, Tab Atkins. He's a standards guy. Um, please it's basically please. just uh, writes the each frame of the video tag to a canvas, writes the bright the brightness levels, and then converts that into ASCII um, or on that side. I thought that was fun, so I like kind of tweaked it, and you can adjust the resolution, make it a little bit more fine or more rough. Um, and I was like, I think we could do this even better. So <clears throat> now we're going to do the same trick, HTML5 video. But we're going to construct a 3D cube using 2D transforms so that all the sides are kind of uh, all ASCII. We can still manipulate. And then we'll like fade the edges for a nice little effect here. But the cool thing you know, with <clears throat> using the native things is you know, I just you know, flipped it around to the back side. You know, this is just an element, and I can manipulate it any way that I want. Um, and that's where, like, the real power of using, you know, HTML5 video in comparison to Flash pays off, that these things just, like, work together. <coughs> SVG. Um, SVG Web is a Flash-based shim that provides support for non-supporting browsers. So that's pretty good to go. Geolocation is not too hard. WebSockets, um, Socket.io by Guillermo is a really uh, nice library that provides support from, I think, IE5 and up um, uh, through Flash, actually mimics the WebSocket API through Flash. Um, 
drag and drop. Like I said, it comes from an IA spec. Input autofocus and placeholder. You know, placeholder is kind of this interaction. Uh, it's you know easy, trivial to, to mimic in JavaScript. So we can just detect support for that, use it if it's there, fall back if it's not. For experimental, the form input types. So like uh, input type equals date. We'll just give you a date picker. It's beautiful. Uh, input type equals color. Uh, ideally would give you a color picker. Uh, these are not widely implemented yet. Opera has the best support. Um, Mobile Safari does a few keyboard tricks. Like if you say it's a input type tell, it'll change the keyboard layout to be numbers. Um, but <coughs> we're getting there. Uh, meter and progress. Progress. Uh, so these are just um, elements on the page. I'll just view source. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just the the top one is an indeterminate progress bar um, because there's no value on it, um, but you can set values and. Meter works the same way. It kind of gives an indication of how full things are. You can kind of set the optimum fullness. Uh, it's pretty cool, but um, it's so, so far this is only in WebKit. <coughs> um, Web SQL database uh, is most popularly used by things like uh, mobile Gmail, um, but the support is going to be limited to Safari and Chrome mobile Safari. That's it, I believe. Um, I9, IE eventually will implement um, index database. Uh, I don't believe it's going into I9. Um, Chrome will support index database, which is you know, essentially a competitor. Firefox uh, will also add that, and Opera will follow suit as well. Um, web storage, so local storage and session storage. <coughs> web workers, WebGL. Can I show off this demo? We released this just a short bit ago, and I think it's badass. <coughs> I also like, this is one of my favorite parts of WebGL is that you get all the polygons and things coming in as the textures are loading in, so it's very like, I just love that the movement still continues as the experience is loading in. I, I think it's really fun. So always fun to look at frame rates and increase numbers of fishes. Uh, 200 fish. <clears throat> I'm gonna change the view, come outside, go. I like, I like to take, let's see, we'll do, we'll take off the tank. Yeah, we'll just have them float around inside there. Take off, add some lasers maybe on the sharks. <laughs> I think so. Smart. L on the keyboard. No one knows. Um, all right, let's roll. <coughs> File API. Uh, this is rad. So um, actually, a Googler just put this out recently. It, it was on a on Hacker News. Um, <coughs> yeah. Okay. So Dropbox.com. Uh, just drag a file into it. So I'll drag in uh, Kool Aid Man and um, a childhood embarrassing picture. And so uh, <coughs> it. I'm just dragging the files into the browser. Uh, it immediately absorbs it through the file API and drag and drop. Um, then I can use uh, HTML5 drag and drop in here to kind of reorder the things um, to kind of go back and forth. And at the same time, it was uploading all these to the server. And if you notice, the URL already changed to something brand new and unique so that I could send this to a friend. So it uses um, HTML5 history's push state to give me a brand new URL without page changing, which I, without the page refreshing, so then I can send it to a friend and have all these pictures. Um, so that's uh, the file API, push state, drag and drop kind of comboing together. Um, <clears throat> that works now in Chrome 6 and Firefox 3.6, I believe. So yeah, it's really rad. For more edge-ish, feature-ishness, I know, hardware acceleration is kind of a feature. Um, it's landing in different places at different times. I definitely got out uh, ahead of the game and accelerated everything on, um, on Vista and 7, of course. Um, Chrome and Firefox are uh, doing hardware acceleration for uh, 
uh, nearly all the same things. Um, you know, 3D transforms, uh, uh, 2D canvas, all that, um, on Vista 7, uh, XP, you know, Snow Leopard, Linux. <coughs> uh, index DB, I already covered. Orientation, we saw, I like orientation. It's, it's a little finicky, so if you use it, you know, especially on a Mac, you kind of want, you can add a little bit of dampening with a WebKit transition, and it'll make, so I added it here. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can kind of like make it look drunk a little bit. Um, so I can turn up the transition to like one second. Yeah. And then it's like, oh. Yeah. Drunkify your orientation. Pro tip. <laughs> Uh, device is really rad, and, and Sony Ericsson is, is really leading the charge here. Um, you know, this is, I was saying beyond HTML5. Um, device is sometimes called HTML5, but it is so rad that I, it is HTML like 10, maybe. Um, you know, so basically just using, uh, you know, straight up markup, we can go into read a webcam. The device element. I can allow the web application to access my yeah. webcam and microphone. Bam. Um, and then we can also connect peer-to-peer -to, -peer to another user Hello, um, and go back and forth. Yeah. I mean, this is just like straight up HTML that enables this now. Uh, it is really exciting, so I can't wait until we start landing this. <laughs> the audio data API, um, I want to mention uh, Firefox is uh, shipping this in, in Firefox 4, and it's really exciting. So not only can you synthesize audio on the fly, but you can also um, read all the spectrum data and essentially provide visualizations. Uh, so they did a really nice uh, demo showing all this stuff. Um, yep. <coughs> and, um, but one thing that's worth pointing out is that the, uh, a guy from Google is writing the spec for this, and what's in the spec currently doesn't match what Firefox has implemented. But that's cool, just Firefox is gonna be changing their API to match the spec uh, later on. So, spectrum data, we're reading this just straight off of this audio file. We can do cool things like that. A little bit of this. I'm a DJ. Clearly. <sighs> Digitalization, Happy Town. It is a really uh, JavaScript based beat detector. More of that. Then we'll like combo 2D canvas with WebGL because that seems necessary and beautiful. Yeah, so awesome. So, Firefox, a, a group, um, there's an experimental uh, working group working on this, they're kicking ass. It's a lot of the guys from Processing JS, actually. <coughs> um, so WebKit has an implementation of this with a special WebKit audio build. Um, you can try, there's a bunch of demos um, out there, too, a little different, but like I said, the API is still kind of in flux. Input type, input, not type speech, just attribute speech. Um, this is so gonna work for my demo. I hope this works, um, because that would be embarrassing otherwise. So it's just an attribute on the, on the tag, so I guess uh, you could throw it on a text area too. Um, oh, hey, what? Mm, yeah. Honestly, I don't know. I, I don't think, I don't know. I don't think that we, we uh, put um, uh, speech, like voice recognition to the browser. I think it goes to Google first, like the, like the Google iPhone app. Um. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right. uh, and then SVG filters, which are so freaking rad, and only Firefox has support for these right now. Um, well, like, I think Opera has a little bit of support, but it's not, not as good. So SVG filters um, in HTML5-ish, basically, 
you can apply to any element. So I have an HTML5 video with just a standard CSS border. I can blur it, uh, inverse, that, whatever. Um, some of that, some of that, mm-hmm. Ah, ooh. I don't know what's going on there, but um, <coughs> this is really exciting, uh, and, I, and I'm hoping that we're gonna, I know SVG filters is not gonna be in IE9, um, but, uh, but, and I'm really hoping that we can get it into WebKit soon. Um, so one of the guys who actually, uh, Filter, who works on the Audio Data API and processing JS and a lot of things, um, he kind of combined a bunch of these things. Uh, so this little button here uh, is a HTML5 video using the Audio Data API to read the audio from it and create the visualization on there. Uh, we have a web font coming in, um, rounded corners, Oh, yes, gratuitous WebGL, um, box shadow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, I mean, this is like, this is extremely exciting to me. It's like when you combine all these different features together, like you see these demos and it's like this feature and this feature and this feature, but like being able to see like seven features come together, you're like, shit, this is powerful, you know? This is really cool that we have this stuff in the browser now. <sighs> All right. Okay. Um, let's say you've, I'm going to go through these fast, but come back to them with me. Um, if you've kicked IE to the curb, you said, I don't care about IE6, um, just let's recover, let's cover over the things that you have, you can now play with. You have full ping support, you don't need to do ping 8 anymore. Position fixed, thanks, thank God. Hover selectors, first child uh, adjacent attribute and child selectors are good. Fixed position backgrounds, min width, max width, good. These are things we need, clearly. If you said i7 is dead, which I think we're going in the direction where we're gonna have six and eight and nine plus uh, for a long time. So seven, I think, might actually die before six in a way. <sighs> uh, post message, you're good. We have it in i8, cross domain XHR for the most part. Native JSON, we don't need JSON2.js anymore. Data URIs up to 32 kilobytes in IE8. Before, after, and focus. Local storage and session storage are both in IE8, even in compatibility mode. Like you're viewing in IE7, but then it has parts of IE8. It's a monster. A lot of fun. Uh, getters and setters on DOM elements, um, so we can actually kind of recreate the HTML5 data set attribute and kind of make it work in IE8, among other things. Query selection, query selector all. Badass, easy element selection, and box sizing, uh, which Microsoft was right in their original box sizing when you combine width and padding, and then it somehow is larger than the width that you already specified, but here you just do this bad boy, uh, and from IE8 and everywhere else, uh, it actually is the width that you say, which is, makes more sense to me. <sighs> but let's say that you're a cross-browser warrior, and you will support all these browsers. So you probably do feature detection, right? You probably use something like Modernizer. I hear it's awesome. Um, but you want to support the older browsers, and you want to give them some of these features and functionality. So you want to employ something like you might call it regressive enhancement. Because we're going to give these features back to the old browsers in a mostly consistent fashion. And this is not really like doing it twice. It's like doing it 1.1 times. And most of the work has already been done for you. And so what I did is I pulled together all the different scripts that people have done to kind of do this thing. And so we have a big happy list of all the, we're gonna call them polyfills, I think. Remy Sharp came up with this, I think it's a good term. Polyfills to basically provide the, the support, the fallback, the shim, whatever. So we have the SVG web, X canvas, um, uh, shims using either window.name or cookies or whatever to, to imitate session storage and local storage. Uh, the media element JS, we throw in a flash object that actually has the API of the HTML5 media elements um, and you kind of use it like you would want to. Um, mimicking all the, the input type date, date picker, color picker stuff. Um, so you're, you're writing code, uh, writing HTML5 code um, that is going to use the native things when it's there and then going to mimic that exact same behavior in older browsers. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff in here, and I've also added a lot of things where we don't really have support for. Um, the progress and meter elements, 
no one's really made a, a script that kind of gives support uh, to older browsers for those. Um, but I'd love to, to, to get your help in kind of um, filling in these holes. Um, and you know, one of the challenges, we want to provide these scripts to older browsers, and then it's like a lot of these little scripts. So we have another new thing from the author of goto.js and co-author of Vapor.js, Alex Sexton. We have yep, nope. Uh, yep, nope is a um, conditional script loader. And so it uses um, lab.js under the hood. And so essentially, this is it. So we're going to just do a test. Um, so modernizer.indexdb. This is going to return either true or false. Yep. If it does return true, we're going to uh, include these files. Otherwise, we're going to chuck in these. Um, and we, so we can get the benefits of a dynamic script loader um, added with uh, conditionalness so we can do our feature detect based on that. Whew. And <clears throat> if that sounds like too much work, you could make money. Chrome Web Store, I hear it's pretty awesome. Uh, so basically, you know, you build a web app, um, you can throw it in the Chrome Web Store. Uh, you're going to have much higher discoverability, um, and you can make money on it, which is a novel idea. Um, you can also play with all the cool things that are in Chrome that might not be in other browsers, or we might be implementing them before other people. Um, you have a lot more storage, desktop-based notifications, the WebGL, the, the drag-in and drag-out kind of stuff, the speech attribute, which I showed you, orientation. That's exciting. So, next steps. Um, like I said, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get uh, some help with some of those uh, remaining polyfills. I think um, this is a this document right now is on the Modernizer Wiki, um, but uh, I think I think there's a lot of places where we can kind of make HTML5 as cross-browser as possible, and it won't be like totally possible. And there's going to be decisions where developers are going to have to choose adding this. Shim to add consistency is just not worth the performance hit, and so we're not going to include it. And that's fine, but it's good to have the option. <clears throat> um, uh, in addition to the features of when i6 and 7 dies, the new features that you have, there's a lot of stuff like um, if you said that you know, Firefox 3.0 is dead to you, then you can use inline uh, display inline block. Uh, Firefox 3.5 dies to you, you have a lot more. Um, uh, things available. Um, so I'd love help um, kind of gathering those up so that we can have a nice document to say, when you kill off this browser, we can use all this brand new stuff. Also has.js um, that P Pete Higgins announced yesterday uh, is going to kind of lay some groundwork for doing a lot of this testing as well. Um, I encourage you to throw this in your pages. Uh, so basically, um, we're going to always force the IE's latest rendering mode. Um, uh, this is a really smart move. There's, I've been hearing reports, and um, I'd love to talk to Microsoft a little bit more about this, but it seems like in IE9, it's a little bit more aggressive about falling back into IE8 IE mode than we were seeing in IE8. Um, and like something in your CSS might trigger it. Um, and so if you want all the benefits of IE9, which you do, um, it's good to just say, I'm opting into this. Please give me the best experience possible. Um, <clears throat> so the second part is Chrome Frame. Uh, this does not prompt use, you, your users to install it. It just says, if they have it, I want to use it. Um, so this is a meta tag, but you can also just send this as an HTTP header. It does the exact same thing for both of them. Uh, that's it for me. Um, thank you for watching. I don't know, do we have time? If there's any questions, I will attempt to. So. More general question, how do Chrome Web Store and Android Mark compare? Go to. Well, um, so I mean, you could build a web app, package it in PhoneGap, throw it in the Android market, um, and then adapt that. Uh, web app to a, a more desktop-y experience and throw it in the Chrome Web Store, too. Um, they're kind of two stores, and um, it'll be interesting to see how kind of, you know, where users use it. But, you know, for, for now at least, the, a mobile experience and a desktop experience should kind of 
be a little bit different. So I think it makes sense that they're, they're kind of separated stores, I think. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys.